Cinema was a mistake. I mean, I'd even talk about a thing like Wolf. You be ferocious. You be relentless. You be telephone. Terrorist. Now let's knock this mother out of the park. I gave it the five stars on my letterbox. I consider it to be a perfect film in that it seems to accomplish everything it seeks to accomplish. Or at least it's doing everything it cinematically should. Every single frame of this is basically a masterclass in filmmaking. The acting, the cinematography, the editing, the dialogue, everything is firing on all cylinders. The film is a collaboration between one of the greatest directors and one of the actors of our time to create what could be argued to be the most iconic film from either's filmography. Is it my favorite from either? Not by a long shot, but it's probably the most entertaining from them. From that point of view, it is perhaps the perfect movie, but it also kind of sucks. There is a song that infamously declares that Ramona Flowers from Scott Pilgrim ruined a whole generation of women. It was born the quirky, colorful haired e girl who's low key a narcissist, while she's pretty, so it's cool. Misogyny aside, we could say that wolves serve the same purpose for a whole generation of men. Bruno Belfort in this film brought the stigma granted money mindset the CEO wannabe tater taught crypto bro we see today. I swear to God, the amount of times I've seen this guy's mug on some Instagram self-help motivation type thing is wild. It almost makes you forget that Jordan Belfort was literally a scammer whose cartoonish amount of wealth obtained through both illegal and immoral means definitely killed people. I mentioned before that this film achieved everything it sets out to, but if people walked away from it trying to emulate this disgusting protagonist, it can't have been that effective, right? Actually, I think we may be making some assumptions here. Let us step back for a second and actually examine the process by which the film was made. What were their intentions? Because again, whenever I watch it, I feel like it really is doing everything it cinematically sets out to. But the people who cite it as one of their favorite films are literally the most obnoxious people on planet Earth. Also, because I'm just... Uh, Bad. This will this will be long. This will be this will be very long. All right. Source material. The Wolf of Wall Street is based on the memoir of the same name by the Wolf himself, Jordan Belfort. Belfort's book examines how he climbed to the top of Wall Street stock market as well as how he fell. Belfort came from relatively modest beginnings, but found himself trying to make a living in the get rich or die trying world of Wall Street. This setting itself undoubtedly planted all the seeds of his corruption. The hustle hustle grind grind philosophy is what allowed Jordan to found his own brokerage firm with his childhood friend. By some master class level scamming and before you know it, the debaucher begins. This is a key point to remember here, you spend relatively little time seeing Belfort's life prior to the rise. When we're introduced to him, he's already a pretty well off young man with a wife who more or less has his future set. He is never suffering. Immediately, he voluntarily enters this chaotic world because he wants to, and while it is all new to him, it's not a change that happens in him so much as a, an evolution. He already wanted this life, and he was going to get it. After that brief introduction, the bulk of the runtime is devoted to watching all the drugs, sex, yachts, mansions, drugs, sex, helicopters, drugs, lions, sex, drugs, drugs. This ended up being what led to his downfall. The man became a, a junkie, he wasn't thinking straight, he was on a whole other dimension half the time, he made poor decisions, he got sloppy. What those f***ing drugs, they're making your mind into mush. It all came crashing down. He went to jail, then left. He became a self-help guru to teach others the rules of the trade, so others can learn to hustle, 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 grind, 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 just like him. And that's uh, the Wolf of Wall Street. See, this kind of story was begging to have a film made about it, and it really couldn't have been made by anyone better. It's 2006, Belford has just been released from prison and is in financial ruin. He sells the rights to his memoir to Hollywood. Leo DiCaprio reads the memoir and instantly gets inspired. Reminds him of the 1979 Tinto Brass film Caligula. Did with doing something like a modern day Caligula, you know. He pitches the idea to Marty Eyebrow Sensei Scorsese. De Niro's too old now to play the lead in Scorsese's films, so he gives him his protege of sorts, Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, told me, um, and by the way, I'm working with this young kid. He's really good. You should work with him sometime. His name is DiCaprio. Right around that time, uh, you know, uh, 
it was the, the last collaboration uh, I did there with the eighth film with De Niro was Casino. Leo and Marty have now been collaborating for a little while, so this was perfect. Production, however, would be an absolute hell. Especially now is incredibly difficult. We we did we did get it financed, um, um, you know, at, at, at about five or six years ago, but it fell apart, and there was some struggles with it. This isn't the '70s anymore. The Hollywood studios don't really want much to do with this debauchery fest. That said, every Scorsese film is a story of doing battle with the Hollywood studios, including his stuff from the '70s. And so Marty was actually pl plotting murder at that point, and could he get away with it? Ultimately, it would only be through the aid of an independent company, Red Granite Pictures, that the film got funded. You pulled it together over these past uh, few years, where you, you were able to get uh, Joey McFarlane and, and uh, RZA and uh, uh, Red Granite to be able to finance the picture with total freedom, meaning, yes, we'll, have, we'll go overboard in the sense of the excess of what they're doing with the language and the sex and all that, and ultimately to have the trust to be able to shape it. You know, but we had to have that freedom in a way, uh, but it couldn't be done with the studio. That was too much for me. And in the greatest piece of cinematic irony, or is this pointing to, to this whole situation, in the years following the film's release, Red Granite was found to be an illegal company built by a young guy who scammed people. I am not making this up. So anyways, let us speak uh, <laughs> briefly about the artists here. Leo DiCaprio kept bringing up Caligula in interviews, so like a big idiot, I actually went and watched the thing. Game modern day Caligula. So I actually can't show very much of this. You see, Caligula is a. How do I? How do I put this? It's a. You gotta be kidding! What? This is a dirty movie. So it's not entirely a porno film. There is a plot. No, no. This, this is a, this is a movie that uh, a lot of couples come. With. It follows the Italian emperor Caligula as he rises to power, wreaks havoc, turns Rome into an absolute joke, and eventually falls. Sounds familiar. DiCaprio says he saw Belfort's story as a modern American version of that story, and it makes sense. It is this maximalist, bombastic epic with elaborate sets, costumes, and a pretty decked out cast. It really sells the feeling of excess and indulgence, obviously, but is this what Caligula is best known for? Again, I won't sit here and pretend like I hadn't heard of Caligula before DiCaprio cited it as one of his influences. It's primarily known for its elaborate, uh, Augie scenes. I'd always known about it as that one porno film that Malcolm McDowell is in for some reason. The thing about excess and indulgence is that while all this is necessary for the plots and of course the grotesque and graphic nature of it, there is a point where as a work of art you have to question its intentions. When I say this is basically a porno, I don't mean it's like something like in the realm of the senses where most of the film is sexual portrayed in some realistic or artsy way. I mean, this is some classic sleazy, hide the kids, graphic, veiny, bushy, fluid. <laughs> Tinto Brass is an erotica director. This is meant to be erotic. Now, let, let's clarify something. If the production for this goes like my last video, this may be a dated topic, but currently there is a debate going on about whether or not it's, uh, this is YouTube. I've already used that word way too much. Egg scenes should be removed from films and TV. There has been a little outcry after an actor who'd recently gotten married said he no longer wished to perform love scenes in films. Then more people started coming out saying how these kinds of scenes are just very awkward and make them uncomfortable. You know, I sat down to watch a cool fantasy drama. Why am I being attacked with boobs every other scene? I give my take on this. And I don't mean to sound like some boomer complaining about how Gen Z is ruining everything, but oh, gee, this is such a Gen Z move. Let's get something clear, alright? I get it. I get that the scenes can feel out of nowhere, and they can definitely make viewing with others kind of awkward. But this is art. Egg is a fundamental part of the human experience, whether you participate in it or not. Art is about the human experience. I think it'd be a little silly if we started policing what people can and can't portray in our art. We don't want to go back to the Hayes Code era, do we? Besides, this is coming from a very Western, 
puritanical American attitude towards eggs where is this massive deal but to tell you the truth I think that's something we should be getting away from I think it'll be a lot less awkward if we stop making it awkward I'm talking to myself with this too but I will concede in that the way it is handled often can be a bit indulgent exploitative and unnecessary as a whole I've never had an opinion about whether or not I actually like these seeds because to me, it's just a part of the package, but I will definitely say there have been some things where I'm like, okay, was that really necessary? Now in a case like Caligula, I will say it absolutely was necessary, but for what purpose? The act itself is not what's dubious, you can't really tell the story of Caligula without those wild Roman augies. But how is it handled? Caligula is a film that seems confused with its own intentions. On one hand, it wants to be an intellectually stimulating character study, but on the other, it's a porn. What's a porn? Something can be defined as being pornographic when it seeks to arouse a sensational emotional reaction not impeded by thought. Something is defined as being intellectually stimulating when it provokes thought. These are opposites, my friend. While I believe that art can and should have no cap on what the artist seeks to accomplish, even if it is something that is seen as impossible, in this case we do have to look at the intentions. Can you explore the theme of indulgence without succumbing to it yourself? Can you have an intellectual conversation that requires you to dead an intellectual conversation? I did watch the entirety of Caligula, for purely research purposes of, uh, of course. It does feel like a film very confused. I was confused. It has too much porn to be a good plot and too much plot to be a good porno. Roger Ebert's review put it best. This film is not only garbage on an artistic level, but it is also garbage on the crude and base level where it no doubt hopes to find its audience. Caligula is not good art, it is not good cinema, and it is not good porn. Damn! People like it though, good for them. DiCaprio is one of them apparently. The only scene that stuck out to me was towards the end. There's this montage which I, c I cannot show any of this. It intercuts an Augie scene where Caligula is looking at his subjects, some soldiers are dancing, there's some gnarly It was almost artsy, but come on, look at that. I'm, yeah, they're trying to tell me there's some greater artistic merit to what they're doing, but oh my gosh, look at that. Listen, not censor it. Look, I, I, I was fascinated with doing something like a modern day Caligula. So that's DiCaprio's main point of reference for this. As for Scorsese. This is the form of story that we've seen Martin Scorsese become iconic for. These themes are present across his filmography. An innocent young man gets romanced by a world of corruption, temptation, greed. He indulges, he partakes, he rises, it is blissful. But then there is the inevitable fall. The big dramatic fallout where every single thing that our protagonist has gained, he loses. This is the very Catholic, spiritual examination of trying to be righteous in a world of sin. From personal reference and interviews, there are two main films that you can compare Wolf to from Scorsese's filmography, The King of Comedy and The Goodfellas. ...is its sense of anarchistic dark comedy, which reminds me so much of your earlier films like After Hours and King of Comedy. The King of Comedy is a dark comedy which follows an aspiring comedian who goes a little nuts after he meets his idol, Call he stops and kidnaps him for a chance to perform on his show. Probably sort of a gag. We get that all the time. Well, I find that strange, you know. But it's typical. Because that's the way they treat even you. Because I'll let you in on a little secret. That's the way they treated me. I'll be upfront. This is my favorite film of Scorsese's. It is hilarious. But it's also very cringe. I love cringe comedy, so it's great. But also, especially if cringe is less your cup of tea, it's clearly a very dark story. It is a satire about celebrity culture and the way we idealize fame. I should try not to talk about this too much because we will be here all day. But the main takeaway here that makes the film work is that no one in their right mind wants to be this guy. Rupert Pupkin is an actual loser. You may be able to relate to him to some extent but he makes you want to get rid of every single one of those traits. This is no Ryan Gosling. Well, would you mind waiting outside, Mr. Pupnik? This is a reception area, not a waiting room. I understand. 
This guy's pathetic, and not in a cool, mysterious way. He's just plain pathetic. Like, good god, Belfort's also pathetic. But damn, is he charismatic as hell. Those scenes where the speeches. I have gone down to the comment sections of YouTube uploads of these scenes. People will know full well that this is a dreadful person who is saying and doing some immoral stuff. But his words and the delivery of Leonardo DiCaprio make you buy into it, even if it's just for a few Get the minutes. Phone and start dialing. Is your landlord ready to evict you? Good. Pick up the phone and start dialing. Does your girlfriend think you're a fucking worthless loser? Good. Pick up the phone and start dialing. I want you to deal with your problems by becoming rich. I had I've been thinking about these 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 speeches for really like six years because to me they were like you know Braveheart speeches, but they're war cries for greed and debauchery and you know persuading his coworkers to go screw as many people over as possible. When Belford has absolutely been walloped by drugs, he is. I mean, he's pathetic as all hell, but in more of a frat bro drunk out of his mind kind of way rather than a poindexter getting his lunch money taken and apologizing kind of way. Speaking of drugs, Goodfellas is the next one where the similarities are across the board. When I found my way in the material, because when I first read it, I, I felt that uh, um, I, had, I had, in a sense, visited this before in other ways. And so, um, but I began to realize that, uh, that uh, <laughs> Um, it is about, it is about, uh, uh, in a sense, you could say, touch upon Goodfellas or Casino yeah, exactly. or pictures like that. Right. And as, in a way, here though, there's, a, there's a, a veneer of respectability. Yeah. It's a kind of toss up between Goodfellas, Taxi Driver and The Wolf of Wall Street, for which is Scorsese's most iconic film. Goodfellas follows Henry Hill, young working class Italian American who gets entranced by the lavish lifestyles of the mobsters around him and becomes one of them. He rises through the ranks, accumulates power unlike anyone is perhaps even supposed to have, but ultimately, the ugly side of the crime life catches up with him. The people he's around are sociopaths, and any day he could be the next one with his brain sputtered across the wall. The drugs, anxiety, and drug-induced anxiety gets to him and he inevitably cries uncle and sells out all his friends, having to go into witness protection. Similarities, especially in the second half of the film, are clear. While Goodfellas isn't as indulgent as Wolf, there is bliss when we're hanging out with these criminals. It feels like you're on top of the world in some scenes. But there is also a constantly hanging dread, whether it is domestic disputes with his wife. I'm telling you, I look at your face and I know that you're lying! Or the anxiety that his partner in crime will snap one day and kill him. He's a big boy. He knows what he said. What'd you say? Right. Funny how? What? Just, you know, you're, you're funny. <laughs> I'm funny how? I mean, fun there is a constant hanging anxiety in Goodfellas. I think this is the main thing that separates Goodfellas and Wolf. Tone. Where Wolf chooses comedy, Fellas chooses suspense. Goodfellas is a scary movie. Especially the drugged out coke segment. While having a segment where the protagonist is hopped up on drugs is the thing these films share in common, the way they handle the scenes is tonally different. While the threat of a possible helicopter following Henry while he's driving is the most stressful thing in the world, Jordan literally almost dies in a shipwreck and it is one of the most hilarious scenes I have ever seen. By the end of Wolf, I'm exhausted, but by the end of Goodfellas, I'm frightened. But there are still people who idolize their characters in Goodfellas. Believe it or not, despite what I will tell you and what you'll hear from audiences about Goodfellas being one of the most effective gangster films of all time, it has still influenced many men to idealize the gangster lifestyle. The amount of times I've seen people online dunk on Henry for being a rat is a little frightening. People will say that the gangsters in this were real men, and yes, their lifestyle is portrayed to be idyllic, up to a point. It is almost as if we are watching a completely different film. Did they not see the second half, or does it just not matter? Scorsese films, as much as I like them, have this effect on people. 
I like to think of his film Silence as the great Rorschach test to determine the real Scorsese fans from the post zeros. Silence is one of Martin Scorsese's most personal and best films, I think. I think it is the one that truly gets to the heart of what his films are about, but half the people who claim to love Scorsese will tell you it was boring. They're not here for moral contemplation. They're here for indulgence. Let us go a bit further and explore some of Scorsese's influences. The main, I think, of course, being... Alright, this may be me being a little indulgent here, but Scorsese cites Federico Fellini as one of his biggest influences, constantly. In the history of movies, there are a few filmmakers who have expanded our way of seeing and completely changed the way we experience the art form. One of them was named Federico Fellini. That's not enough to call Fellini a filmmaker, he was a maestro. And La Dolce Vita is one of his most iconic films. So together with the Cineteca di Bologna and Medusa, they have made possible the digital restoration from the original negative of his 1959 masterpiece, the film that conquered the world, La Dolce Vita. It just so happens that it's also one of my favorite films and I have my own relationship with it. The similarities between Vita and Wolf are more present than any film I've discussed up to now. But Ultra Vita is a three hour long epic about a horny bastard who indulges in all the debaucheries of high society and eventually meets his downfall because of it. With La Dolce Vita, however, the fall is not a financial one, but a spiritual one. Both of these films are highly iconic in their own right, cause lots of controversy for the risque nature of the content, star arguably their country's most iconic actor, directed by arguably their country's greatest director, and feature a blonde with an almost spiritual hold on the protagonist, portrayed by a foreign actor, and explore the emptiness of the bourgeoisie. Marcello Mastroianni plays Marcello, a journalist who explores these various social events and happenings, indulging in all the privileges of high culture, though remaining at an emotional distance. There's a fiancé who tries to kill herself because he neglects her so much. A mistress who he may love, even if he has not accepted it himself, and a whole world of floozies he messes around with. Marcello is literally me. Not that I am a womanizer, but I can relate to this longing to be a part of a culture that is maybe not for him, or at least does not provide him with any real sense of joy. He is like the protagonists I have spoken about up to now, sure, but La Dolce Vita, I think, goes deeper. Beyond the whole moral tale and speaks more to the fulfillment of the soul. Greed is a primary vice for Belfort and Caligula, but greed is one of the oldest themes in fiction. Sure, greed comes from a need to fulfill some gap in the soul, but for something like the Dolce Vita, money and power, while not being absent from the picture, obviously, is not directly shown. Marcello cannot connect to anyone around him. Jordan, Henry, and Rupert have friends who they are, at least, portrayed to genuinely have a bond with. Marcello has many friends, but it is clear he does not truly feel connected to any of them. This is why I think it goes deep. Why do you like La Dolce Vita? Well, I was just explaining that, wasn't I? Blah, 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 it's deep and whatever. But why do you like it? It's a brilliantly written examination of isolation and how our society... You have Charlie Kaufman for that. Why does this film do something for you? Well, I like Kaufman too, don't I? I relate to the protagonists and his wanting to indulge. It's a well-written criticism against myself and I think it's healthy. I said this earlier. Ah. But why do you often use this protagonist? who represents traits you want to get rid of to represent you. Why do you always use music from the film? Why is Fellini's back catalog one of your favorite filmographies? You really telling me City of Woman is a five-star film? <laughs> It is peak. Hmm. It's, it's just well made. Yeah. 
It's fun, okay? It, I, I like the maximalist sets and the grandiosity of it all. I like living vicariously through this character and running around with these white Europeans. I like all the visuals. I like the spectacle. I, it's, it's fun. It's an enjoyable time. Even if the film is supposedly critiquing everything being shown, I have a good time indulging at a safe distance. Marcello wears fancy clothes and I'm Marcello and I, I, I like it. implies an awareness of being seen by the spectator. They are not naked as they are. They are naked as you see them. Often, as with the favorite subject of Susanna and the Elders, this is the actual theme of the picture. We join the Elders to spy on her. She looks back at us, looking at her. Sometimes the woman, Susanna, looks at herself in a mirror, picturing to herself how men see her. She sees herself, first and foremost, as a sight, which means a sight for men. Thus, the mirror became a symbol of the vanity of women, yet the male hypocrisy in this is blatant. You paint a naked woman because you enjoy looking at her, you put a mirror in her hand, and you call the painting vanity, thus morally condemning the woman whose nakedness you have depicted for your own pleasure, and thus, incidentally, repeating the biblical example by blaming the woman. Mary Magdalene is an interesting biblical figure because she's become more of an idea than an actual person. Churches and on our walls, in our chapels, and in our windows, in our paintings, and in our dreams. Mary allegedly was a prostitute who wept at Jesus' feet and was cleansed from her unrighteousness. She then sort of becomes a part of his posse. But not much significant happens with her besides that, except maybe for when she found Jesus' tomb was empty. Falling at his feet, the Magdalene tries to touch Jesus, but he tells her not to. He's not a man anymore. He's a god. Why, out of all the important figures in the Bible, was Mary Magdalene singled out to witness Christ's resurrection? In the Middle Ages, when they were especially unkind and misogynistic about these things, the explanation that was usually given was that women were gossips and that by showing himself to a woman, Christ was ensuring that word of his return would quickly spread. Artists, however, seem enthralled with Magdalene. You would think she was this prominent figure in the biblical story. Mary has constantly been painted by the great artists as that seductress, a sort of tragic woman, oozing with sensuality but longing for redemption. Over the years, she's become synonymous with various women referenced in the New Testament. Anytime there's a prostitute made reference, you can bet the first person they will think of is Mary. Why do these religious artists have such a fascination with this woman? Oh, how artists through the ages have loved the idea that Mary Magdalene was a temptress. Why did the church have such a fascination? Why are we so obsessed with her? Why does she ring our bell so loudly? And if she wasn't any of the things they say she was, who really was she? Who she truly was has become this great mystery, in fact, to tell you the truth, I lied to you. She wasn't a prostitute, there is no mention of her being a prostitute at all in the scriptures. But this is the narrative that's been spun. This is what many of these paintings depicted. In fact, 
this is how I was introduced to her. When his most valuable lesson was this, don't be spooked by the experts. Oh, she's the prostitute who is being stoned. Then Jesus told the crowd, he who has not sinned cast the first stone. That wasn't her. Nowhere in the thing does it say that that was her. Well, my opinion about expert is that it's something far too overestimated. It's a metier who shouldn't even exist. <laughs> and how right he was. It should not exist that one single person makes a decision about what's good or what's bad. The forgeries were genuine. The proof, and I quote, was irresistible, unanswerable, and overwhelming. But these artists, these storytellers, these preachers, these writers, these historians, they all seem a bit caught up in this great obsession with the idea, the narrative, what narrative, the tragic woman, the seductress. We join the elders to spy on her. She looks back at us looking at her. They are so keen on capturing this great beauty but in actuality they might be projecting. These painters, are they really capturing some great truth? Or are they creating it themselves? Lying. So in a movie, almost any story is almost certainly some kind of lie. Perhaps not deliberately, but on a subconscious level. Maybe when they craft that soft skin, those wide eyes, maybe they aren't capturing the divine, as all the scholars will have you believe, but rather they just liked painting hot chicks. I'm not gonna go into the usual capitalism shtick, though I, I really could, because I think I'm familiar enough with both Scorsese and DiCaprio to know that in spite of any of their professional or personal flaws, these are two people who are genuinely in it for the love of the craft. But Wolf of Wall Street was created to be a great film, first and foremost. But what I want to draw a little attention to is what that even means, to them at least, even subconsciously. I, mentioned silence before. Silence was Martin Scorsese's film he directed directly after the release of The Wolf of Wall Street, though it had been in development hell literally from before the real Jordan Belfort built his empire back in the 80s. It was a passion project and is seen by many to be one of Martin Scorsese's most personal films. It tackles directly a theme that has been present in most of Scorsese's films, even Wolf. Faith and Temptation and follows two Jesuit missionaries in the 17th century who go to Japan and are persecuted. The central conflict of the film, though, isn't so much the killing or torture of these priests, but rather whether or not they should apostatize in order to save the Japanese who are following them. Don't speak to me. You have no right to speak to me. Oh, no, I do. Because you are just like me. You see Jesus in Gethsemane and believe your trial is the same as his. Those five in the pit are suffering too, just like Jesus, but they don't have your pride. They would never compare themselves to Jesus. By publicly renouncing their faith, they may dissuade their followers from following the faith, saving their lives, but it would also mean potentially deterring their more divine salvation. This film is mostly like the title suggests. Silent. I fought against your silence. There are no trademark Scorsese needle drops. It is just contemplation. Occasional cries for mercy and crashing waves. It is a slow burn as well. This film tonally is diametrically opposed to the usual Scorsese aesthetic, but it is thematically potentially his magnum opus besides maybe The Last Temptation of Christ, but some of y'all don't want to hear that. I also suggested earlier that it put off half of Scorsese's audience, perhaps due to this tonal shift. The thing is though, this abandonment of the usual tone is why many will tell you that silence is his most personal. It is completely stripped bare of the usual pomp and circumstance. Wolf, however, had Scorsese taking an uncharacteristically impersonal approach. This has more damn energy, or at least as much, probably more energy than any film you've ever made, which is saying a hell of yeah, a lot. It does, yeah. I mean, you must have the same energy that you have to make to make a film like this. How well, do you that, get that was, every... that was one of the reasons I didn't want to do it. Another reference Scorsese mentioned in an interview, though not citing it as much as DiCaprio did Caligula. Talking about it as a, you know, a modern day fall of the Roman Empire, yeah. or like a modern day Caligula. Was sweet smell of success. 
I admittedly hadn't seen or even heard of Sweet Smell before researching this, but yeah, it's, it's pretty good. It's a film following a character who is going through a similar moral degradation as Belfort. He's a little working class schmuck who's surrounded by elites who are sort of kicking him around. He then takes a deal by this newspaper man to break up his sister and her boyfriend by any means possible. So he does. There are a few noticeable differences between this and Wolf that I must point out. This film is half the length and at most a quarter of the budget of Wolf. There is a modest cast and an equally modest number of sets. There's nothing visually flashy besides some cool cinematography and editing, but I think the message is executed wonderfully. I, heard you. I don't believe it. I know, I know, the strongest cop in town. <laughs> the character's arc is similar to that of Wolf because we are seeing the corruption of greed transforming the character, though again, with Wolf at the start, he's already sort of there. Success's protagonist goes through a notable shift from being innocent in the first act. Oh, JJ, I need you here for two minutes. Mac, yes? I don't want this man at my table. To compromise his morals in the second act. What kind of an act is this? Don't you think I have any feelings? What am I? A bowl of fruit? To becoming a downright villain by the third. Jordy's arc is more slightly scummy, but wet behind the ears in the first act to downright cartoon villain in the second. The cartoon villain who realizes he's getting a little reckless in the third. It is not so much a story about morality at all. The third act of Wolf, when everything falls apart, feels more like we've had our fun, but now all things must come to an end. While in success, you can tell that the protagonist is genuinely remorseful and ashamed at who he has become. This is because the Wolf of Wall Street is not a story about morality at all. What? You just said- I know what I said. It's about excess. Greed, of course, is a part of excess, but there is definitely a difference between a story about an innocent person being perverted by a system and a story about a person already perverted by a system being victim to his own indulgence. A better comparison, and the final one in this video, I... I promise you. This little film you may have heard of that they call the greatest of all time. For our final example, we go to the bane of every film student's existence, the height and killer of Orson Welles' career, Citizen Kane. When rewatching Citizen Kane for a class, the parallels between this and Wolf became prominent. This is yet another, as we've been discussing this entire video, story about a corrupted man being killed by greed. Indeed, this may be very well the template that all of these films have followed over the years. What makes this one such an interesting comparison though is that aesthetically it bears so much in common with Wolf but feels completely different. Like Wolf, it starts out showing the excesses of its protagonist, briefly showing backstory and then gets right back into the excess. It also has the protagonist deserting his brunette wife to go with his blonde mistress who he then domestically abuses later on in the film after she threatens to leave him. Belfort's empire is built illegally, while Kane's is initially built through virtuous means which soon get corrupted, but in the usual capitalistic way, so that's where they differ. But it is clear that the emotional core of both of these films is the excesses and thirst for power of its protagonist. Both of them eventually meet their downfall because of this endless thirst. They are both highly satirical stories, though one is more comedic than the other. So why does Kane's message seem to hit with audiences more than Wolf? Citizen Kane features some of the most maximalist sets you'll see in Golden Age Hollywood but there is still, somehow, an emptiness to the film. It's going back and forth through time, we're hearing stories second hand, characters are talking over each other. Hello, Mr. Bernstein. Excuse me, Mr. Can you Kane. prove it isn't? This just Mr. Bernstein, in. I'd like you the to The film Bain. seems to deliberately keep its audience at an arm's length. Also, Charles Foster Kane, the protagonist, is kind of a schmuck. Maybe not initially, when he was young, he very much had the atmosphere of a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed kid ready to take over the world, much like Belford at the start of Wolf. But the film rather quickly establishes that he is not a good person, again, through that non-linear structure. When we see him morally deteriorate, it's not like we're completely detached, but we never quite feel like we're deteriorating with him. With Belford, we watch his rise firsthand. It's euphoric seeing him 
gather up his boys and build himself up. While this is initially exciting to see Kane transform his newspaper office and celebrate his victories, we soon cut to his doomed marriage which deteriorates before our eyes in one of the greatest montages in cinematic history. The film is constantly undercutting any feeling of indulgence by keeping us at an arm's length. Even Kane's literal castle, which he builds for himself and his wife, looks like the most spacious prison you've ever seen. What are you doing? Oh, one thing I never can understand, Susan. How do you know you haven't done it before? Makes a whole lot more sense than collecting statues. He and his wife literally have to yell at each other to hear the other. It's actually kind of hilarious. But this is the perfect example of Citizen Kane ensuring that any lavishness that Kane indulges in is being undercut by the true ugliness that lays beneath. This, I think, is a good way to properly critique excess. Both, however, more or less completely immerses us in this three hour long epic that feels like the most expensive college spring break trip romp with the boys. Sure, they almost get killed every other scene and are literally losing their minds, but is it so much fun? Kane isn't fun. Film students who aren't me hate Kane. If any of you are watching this, you jerks! But this is kind of a testament to how successfully Kane manages not to indulge in what could easily be another wolf, Caligula, or Vita. And not that it's, maybe it's true, but there's no way that people really know that at this point. Well, they have, there's 95% of scientists that say. No, it's not. It's not true. 95% of the scientists say handpicked. It's just a full statement. So, okay, go check it. It's not true. Okay? I don't know no, about that. No, it's just not true. Okay? So, it's there's, just not true. There's a majority of no. scientists that have not true. evidence that humans no, it's not true. are amplifying not true. climate change. It's not true. Where no, are you 95, getting that from? Go, go dig into the facts. That 95% is a selection. And again, it's not like I ever saw Jordan Belfort as someone to look up to. I always found The Wolf of Wall Street to be an entertaining film, but it was because the characters were all so stupid. I hate this kind of materialistic, apathetic person, and seeing a film where they are so blatantly portrayed as idiots is extremely satisfying. However, I think there is still a conversation to be had for the many who still manage to thoroughly misread the film. Like I said in my last video, a person will always ultimately get from a work of art whatever they will. But this does not mean that the author has no authority over how their work is received. From the references the creators have cited as well as what I know of their careers, I'm pretty sure I know what their intentions were with the story, but I think that it is still important to point out how we might miss the mark in our execution. So in the most long-winded way possible, I decided to explore several examples of this kind of story so that you and I can benefit from a more informed perspective of how these stories can and have been handled. I tried to have this conversation with someone before and they gave me the typical artist subjective shtick. And while, like I said, a person will always come away from work of fiction with their own opinion, art is communication. Communication can be done effectively and ineffectively. We never completely understand each other, even in regular conversation, but we can at least try, can't we? Again, there's a capitalism angle to this in how the message of a story might be sabotaged by the creator's quest to make money. But knowing our authors of this particular film as well as its disastrous production, I know that that just isn't the case. I need to keep the woke moralism in check sometimes anyway and just talk about art. Besides, the next video I have planned gets more into that stuff.